Nash came at 2015, and then I think it was about a year later, Kelly brought it up and said, hey, we're, we're ready for, for another one, or she was, and um, she said, what you think? And I said, sure, let's, let's do it, let's do it. And we, I think both of us were praying for a girl, and we'd have a little boy and a girl, kind of a million dollar family, kind of living the dream, and here comes Brynn. So um, that, that kind of completed our family. Brynn's head is in my lap and her legs are in the doctor's lap and she starts feeling around and she looks down and she's feeling, she looks up like this and she says, have you felt this? And I said, no. And she said, okay. And she let me put my hand there and I felt, and I just felt something hard, hard, hard. And I was thought, okay. Um, and then we went further and she, you know, said, I don't want to alarm you, but you know, I want to go ahead and get some you know, some labs, I want to get an x-ray, and I was like, okay, and I was still just kind of calm, and she said, you know, in pediatrics, we don't wait around. I said, now, when will you have all this done? And she said, oh, right now. I'm sending you right now to do this, and I thought, oh, and then my heart kind of dropped. We came home, Nash was with my mom, and we popped the key in the door, and about the time we did, Kelly's phone rang. Um, went outside, she put um, Dr. Coates, which was the, the pediatrician that we saw on speaker, and she, I'll never forget it, um, said, we got a, gosh, we got a bed waiting for you at Levine's. I can't even tell you the emotions that were, that were going on through that stay. Um, we were there probably four days that initial stay, and then got home, and then kind of, um, during that, met obviously Dr. Osterheld right before we came home, and he was kind of prepping us of what we could expect, and, um, kind of going without getting into too much details, but it was just a out of body experience and things that you, you think that will never happen. All of a sudden you're sitting in that hospital room listening and hearing and realizing that you're just helpless looking at your daughter in the hospital room and how much it just, a rug is just pulled out from under you and your life is never the same and our life never will be the same. We started our first chemo cycle right after Christmas. We got through it, and then her hair started coming out. We cut her hair. There wasn't so much that we got in the group because everything happened so fast. There's not time to figure it out. I mean, we came in on December 11th. By December 13th, she'd already had her scans and biopsy, and we knew what we were dealing with. I mean, there's no time to take anything in. And then within a month, she had her G-tube, and then it's her stem cell retrieval. I mean, everything, boom, 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 boom. There was no, let's get normal, or let's, let's make a normal. It was, let's just get through to the next day, next appointment, just like you said, just go, go, go. And then during all that, we figured out how to be home with both our kids and just enjoy the moment and snuggle up and cry or whatever it was that we needed to do. We just we just did it. And people I know have asked us several times, you know, how do you do it? And I thought, I remember saying that to people or thinking that for people that were in similar situations, whether it was a death of a child or a spouse or whatever the case, like how do you do it? And you just do. People would do the same thing. You don't you don't have another option. And people say, Oh, I would I would just fall apart. Mm -hmm. Well, you do, but you get back up. I mean, there's no other option. You're a parent. You have to be a parent. I felt very isolated um, personally and then as a family. Uh, I felt that, you know, we were completely blindsided by everything. So we were by ourselves in the sense that we did not have another family to kind of relate to and bounce ideas off of. You know, what we were experiencing were things that that no one I knew was, you know, was doing. You know, kids are signing up for soccer and we're taking our daughter in to have tumors cut out. Like it was just very, really hard to kind of find that commonality with our friends who have been nothing but supportive, but it was just very difficult to kind of find like where we stood. You know, I am hopeful that she doesn't remember anything that she's going through. I'm hopeful that she does gain some strength and being able to be, um, you know, use all the hell she's had to go through to her benefit. Um, I'm hopeful that the story that we're putting out there will gain awareness. I'm hopeful that pediatric cancer will, will be funded. I'm hopeful for a cure. I'm hopeful that Bryn 
stays cured. That's always going to be in the back of our mind every time we go to a scan. I think they call it scanxiety. Uh, you know, it's it's real. It's true. We're hoping that you know, I'm hopeful that she will never have to deal with this. I'm hopeful that she doesn't have to, any side effects and she is able to to be a mother one day. That the chemo doesn't um, take that from her. And um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what's what we said before, we put one foot in front of the other, and as I'm doing that, I remain hopeful.